Hello and welcome to another day of Advent of Code. We are back for day 23, which was, at least for me, I spent a long time on this probably. My code is not great. I also haven't spent time cleaning it up, but I figured I would show you uh, my approach to the problem and how I eventually got a solution. Um, all right, so we are starting with an input that is a maze with hallways and with one hallway and rooms. Uh, it looks like this. These four slots here are the rooms, and this is a hallway where things can freely move into them. And the goal of this is to end up with each of the hallways or each of the rooms filled with their proper letter. So this would be AA, this would be BB, CC, DD. Uh, and the sample input has two that are already solved. Uh, so that's why it is supposed to be much faster than your actual input. Your actual input will have you know four incorrect values here. And uh, the problem is, is a bit constrained in how things can move. Uh, otherwise, this problem gets much, much more difficult. And the way things can move is from a spot here. So right now in this position, only these four can move. Um, these ones cannot because they are blocked in. And two things cannot occupy the same spot. Uh, this one here can move to the hallway, but it can only move to places that are not directly outside of a room. Uh, so here, 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 oops, and here. Those are the possible places that that one can move, uh, as well as all the other ones. So you can kind of imagine all of the possible moves from a, from a particular state and trace that as a graph. And uh, the move costs, or the moving a particular type costs a variable amount. So moving an A is really, really cheap. Moving a D is really, really expensive. And so from that, you can basically traverse a graph of costs and use something like Dijkstra's or any other you know, cost-based pathing algorithm to figure out the shortest path from this starting position to an ending position. And that's basically what I did. I used Dijkstra's similar to day 15, uh, but, but my code for the intermediate step transitions is awful. <laughs> But, but I'll show it to you anyway. Uh, and actually, while I was solving this, I had a different solution, which was just depth first with pruning. And um, I ran it, and it took an hour to complete, but eventually got the right answer uh, with enough pruning and running with <laughs> PyPy instead of Python 3. Uh, so it is possible to do this problem without an ideal solution because the state space is relatively small. Uh, but anyway, let's jump into the actual code here. Uh, so I have jumped us directly into our compute function using kind of a, a neat little feature that some text editors have. This is my own text editor that I wrote that also has this feature, uh, but it basically jumps you to a particular line. So this is the main loop of my actual compute function. And so you can kind of see how it works just based on this part. Uh, this part is completely sane. The rest of the problem is kind of nuts. <laughs> or at least the rest of my solution is kind of nuts. Uh, basically, you know, parse the initial state, have a set of seen things. This is essentially Dijkstra's. Uh, have a priority queue and uh, use heap queue uh, to push and pop from it so that it maintains the priority queue and prioritize based on the minimum score. That way you are looking at the minimum path all the time. So anytime you reach a spot, you know it's the minimum cost to get to that spot. Uh, and you know if it's completed, you're done. If you've seen it already, you skip it because you are now at a longer path to get to the spot than the current spot. Uh, otherwise, you mark it as seen, and you push every continuation step from here. This is basically Dijkstra's uh, implemented iteratively instead of recursively. Um, and this works great. This, this uh, completes the problem fine. Uh, the gross part is the implementation of this function. Uh, I think my state parsing is actually fairly straightforward. Um, this is how I decided to represent my state. Uh, which in, in retrospect, this could have been a list of rows and that might have been easier. Um, instead, I just manually had each row as a separate dictionary. <laughs> I actually did re-implement it as a, as a nested mapping of rows and the code was cleaner, but it was like 18 times slower. And so I just, you know, <laughs> elbow greased it out and went with, went with this way. Um, but yeah, so the, the interesting thing about this state class, I used dictionaries here because they were convenient to update. Uh, 
but they were inconvenient in other ways. For instance, hashing them, uh, they're immutable objects, so they can't really be hashed. I treated this as immutable, so I'm able to hash them here. Uh, like, I don't modify these dictionaries at any point. I probably should have used mapping instead of dict here. That way, uh, the type checker enforces that I don't mutate them. That would have been better. I also need to make them comparable because we put them into a heap queue and it tries less than on them. Uh, but we don't actually care about the... Uh, the comparison here just that it's stable so i use the memory address to compare them you could you know compare based on hash or something more deterministic like uh, comparing the actual items of the dictionary but i decided not to and just went with a sloppy hash comparison or sloppy um, memory address comparison i guess id isn't always memory address but in, in c python it is uh, i have a function that tells me whether i've completed it that way we know quickly that it's quickly that it's done. Uh, and for that, I'm just comparing all of the keys and values into my row. Uh, I guess I should say I use ints to keep track of each of these things. So A is zero, B is one, C is two, and D is three. This made it convenient for two reasons. One, the uh, correct room that they match up into will be their exact number. The other is these are powers of 10 compared to these numbers. So this is 10 to the zero, 10 to the one, 10 to the two, 10 to the three. So that's why I represented them as integers, makes that a little bit easier to handle. Uh, my parsing is relatively straightforward. Uh, these are the possible, oh, actually, I forgot to mention a shortcut for part one. Uh, technically in part one, these two slots aren't necessary uh, because you only need two memory slots to swap an entire column. Um, so you only need these four slots here, uh, or those, five slots there. Uh, so that can speed up your problem. It's just just performance hack. It doesn't really affect the correctness here. Uh, but in the in the second problem, I use 0, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10 to represent all of the valid slots in this hallway. Uh, then I just parse these. I use this mapping to map them to numbers. Another way that I could do this is, uh, let's say, we have uh, A, B, C, D here, and we want to do four C and C's mapped equals ORD A minus ORD C, or no, no, the other way around, ORD C minus ORD A, uh, and that will, I should have just printed. <laughs> this will give us our, uh, our actual number that we want there. Let me use double quotes. X here. Uh, oh, I forgot to do C bang R. I meant to do. There we go. So you can see how we map those here. So this is, a, this is another way to do that. I just wrote a dictionary because it was quick and easy. Uh, so that's how the parsing works. I made a representation because I spent a lot of time debugging why my states were ending up in invalid states, and so this this was helpful for that. Uh, name table comes with a default wrapper, but I wanted these on multiple lines so I could see them at a glance what was going on because they were all smushed together and hard to hard to understand. And now we get to the terabad function, which is my next states function, uh, and this basically implements the logic from like where can this go and generate all the next states from that? Or if it's here, which places can it try and enter? And sometimes none of those are valid. And so uh, a piece is frozen in that case. Um, but yeah, this is all just kind of terrible manual logic for everything. Um, I can show you a few kind of neat things about the data structures that I used. Uh, this is my update step where I just take the current dictionary and then splat another key on top of it. Um, this was the main reason that I used dictionaries was because this operation was easy to represent syntactically. Whereas if I had a tuple, I would have to like slice, insert, and slice. And that I felt looked ugly. So <laughs> this worked fairly well. Um, also, as I talked about earlier with the powers, this is just 10, 10 raised to whatever the value is. Um, and this is just my row insertion logic. And for part two, it's much more complicated because I multiply it by two. Um, but this actually looks very similar to the one above. You can see I have this source column, max C, min C, to move top. This is basically to figure out where along the top it can move. So if it's 
if its target is here uh, and its source is here, we know that we have to check all of these values in here and we have to move that distance in the top row. And that's kind of what this represents here. That two plus I times two figures out what column it's supposed to be in. Um, but yeah, that's basically that's basically the problem. That's basically how I approached it. Just kind of a generator for the next set of states. This is the part that I would refactor the most if I were to go back and improve this. Um, but you know, this this part reads fairly well. Um, for part two, the only difference is I extended those two rows to be four rows and added in the two manual rows that are supposed to be there. I, of course, updated all of these functions for that. Uh, and <laughs> then I added more if statements, <laughs> which, you know, not, not the greatest, but it got the job done and that was what really mattered. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's, oh, I forgot to say, yeah, we insert two rows for part two, yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's day 23. Hopefully you found this useful and I will see you around for the next one.